A narrative review by Mitchell looked at clinical spinal instability from the spans of 2005 to 2015 and how the clinical prediction rule had influenced treatment. And what the clinical prediction rule was, was it was based on an article by Hicks. And it was looking at a set of criteria to look at who would respond well to spinal stabilization exercises, so core strengthening. And what they found was that there were four different criteria that predicted whether somebody would respond favorably to spinal stability exercises. The four criteria for a positive outcome were a positive prone instability test, a positive aberrant motion, a straight leg raise greater than 91 degrees, and then age less than 40. For a positive aberrant motion, they're defined in a couple of different ways. So basically we can have pain with flexion and extension of the low back, a, catch, a catching sensation when we're actually moving through those movements, a positive goer sign, which is essentially using your hands on your thighs to help climb back up after you've bent forward, or a deviation from the sagittal plane when you're flexing and extending the low back. So you're going either side to side or maybe a little bit of rotation. For a negative result, the four criteria were a negative prone instability test, an absence of those aberrant motions, a fear avoidance belief questionnaire score of less than eight, and then no hypermobility on a lumbar spring test. This narrative review points out that these clinical prediction rules have actually not been validated yet. There was another study that tried to validate them, and what they found was that while these clinical prediction rules show promise, the study was underpowered to actually make a recommendation. And what that study found is that two out of the four were actually more helpful than the others, and those two were the prone instability test and then the presence of aberrant motions. When looking at treatment, spinal stability exercises do seem to provide some benefit for those with low back pain, but those results don't seem to be superior to those of other forms of exercise. And specifically when we look at the clinical prediction rule, for those who satisfy the criteria for a positive result, they do seem to get a little bit better than when they're subjected to a different treatment such as manual therapy. However, as noted before, those results are still preliminary and there's not enough evidence to actually support that recommendation yet. However, again, there's promise to those clinical prediction rules. This study is actually very interesting to me, and the reason why is because when we think about low back pain, we think it's synonymous with the core, and that we need to strengthen the core muscles and stabilize that low back, and that's the way, or that's the path to recovery from low back pain. But really when we try to break down spinal instability, we don't have a good way of actually assessing for it. Even when we look at these clinical prediction rules, just because somebody has a positive prone instability test, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have instability or that their spine is unstable. It could be that the pain is reduced with the prone instability test because they have muscle guarding, they have activation of those muscles, which helps to decrease the pain. It doesn't um, translate directly to a positive prone instability test equaling instability. I think what it more so means is that activation of the muscles helps to reduce the pain. and so we can't make that inference that the spine is actually unstable. And a similar thing can be said about with the presence of aberrant motions. We know that pain will alter somebody's movement patterns. And so if somebody is bending forward and they have pain, first of all, that doesn't tell us anything about the stability of the spine. It just says that whenever they flex forward, there's pain, or if they extend, there's pain. It doesn't tell us about stability of the system. And just because somebody deviates um, outside of just flexion and extension, so if they laterally bend or if they rotate, that really just says that they're moving in a different way to maybe avoid pain versus actually uh, any sort of inclination that there's instability in the system. And this brings us to spinal stability exercises. And when we look at some of the research, spinal stability exercises aren't more effective than other forms of exercise for low back pain. And one of the ways that we can kind of think about this is, are spinal stability exercises actually beneficial because they strengthen the core muscles and therefore reduce spinal instability? Or can uh, spinal uh, stability exercises actually just be beneficial because they're a low threshold strategy 
And so that allows uh, the patient who's in pain to start contracting the muscles and moving their body. And that gives them the confidence that they need to recover from the pain and or injury. Also, we can look at it from just a pure exercise perspective in that these isometric exercises, which is what a lot of core exercises are, that they're just stimulating the exercise biochemical sequence and that's giving us an analgesic effect. Similar to if we go for a walk or if we run, they're stimulating those systems to help give us pain relief with low back pain. Although I think it should be mentioned that exercise doesn't actually seem to be that effective at reducing pain. The effect sizes are usually mild to moderate. And it's possible that core exercises or advice to go walk or lift or run actually just helps the patient uh, improve their function and that's actually how they improve um, instead of actually from a pure pain perspective.